I'll take a civilian who's a prepper over a military veteran who's not really a prepper any day of the week, uh, usually, nine, you know, nine times out of ten. Uh, one of the big issues that I'll recognize, especially in blue collar work, which I do nowadays, is the uh, military, yeah, they can kind of deal with them if they were on, you know, the working side of the military. Okay, I can. Uh, some admin jer jerk off. You, you play this admin stuff where you like got to quote all sorts of rules about why you can't do your job or should do your job or try to shut down a job site because blah blah blah. But you got to um, play that and I'll probably kick your ass before you're fired. I mean that's kind of how it works. Uh, nobody shuts down my job site except me. And I've had some guys, you know, try that shit. Uh, and I'm not talking about safety, I'm talking about just some fucking excuse. And, uh, but there was a lot of whining shit I'd see in the military that if you, if you're out there building the houses, doing remodel work, uh, any of that kind of stuff, working on the big iron, and play some of the whiny bullshit I've seen in the military, uh, you, you know, you, you, you get your ass beat, and then, you, and then you're out of there, or they'll just fire you, you know, or, uh, something, you know, it, they usually deal with it. They just don't have time for that kind of shit. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of meddling, you know, judgmental drama and politics in the corporate world, which military people just ain't going to put up with. I mean, it's a certain level, you know, these things go. Generally speaking, a lot of construction guys, uh, I worked for a tree service company where, uh, the climbers tend to be, you know, these are the guys that we, we uh, the, the climbers tend to be the real cowboys in that stuff. We had one who was a former cab scout, and he was, uh, he was badass. And we had another guy who was just psycho, and yeah, it kind of had to be to do, it was dangerous work, it paid well, it was hard, and it took a lot of skill. And so, this was back in the 90s. And the climbers are making about 25 bucks an hour. Uh, groundsmen made around 10 or 15, depending on where you're ranked in it. I think I was making 10. I wasn't. I wasn't getting rich doing that. It was, and it was hard shit. Uh, it was hard, hard as anything I did in the military. I did. Uh, we had a lot of rope and a lot of knot work. It had to be on that game because when that branch comes swinging down, we're having to take trees apart, piece by piece, because it was in a wealthy neighborhood. If a piece falls and hits a sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollar car, you got problems, right? Uh, and these guys would cut the logs into the largest possible piece to do less cutting because they're up at the tree. Well, but it has to be a piece that somebody can move with. So I was taking those those military repelling gloves because you know we're doing all this stuff, lowering them on ropes and grabbing them and that kind of stuff those military horse hide repelling gloves and I wore out um, uh, one pair every other week and it was, I was taking them in my National Guard armor because we had those issued to combat engineers and I'd say listen uh, can, I, can I turn turn some of these in and then I was buying them at the PX I was still having to uh, go into you get special order them through AFES but a lot of times they weren't at the PX and if you wore those black dress gloves as work gloves, which a lot of people did, you'd destroy those in three days. Um, so, you know, this was like logging work about, you know, on uh, logging work plus a bunch of hassle. And uh, you guys are cutting these logs into big pieces, you know, and I was, I was bodybuilding. I, I barely lift that stuff. Uh, but I got big and strong. And Cat Scout guy was strong. But the thing is, uh, so was a psycho dude who would cut the top off a redwood tree, take all the safety shit off and do handstands on the thing. Well, hard enough to convince him to leave his clothes on when he's doing handstands on this thing just to show off for chicks or something. It'd be down, down below like maybe five stories, six stories. Yeah, it was that crazy. On the other hand, in a, in a chips are down situation, those types of dudes, yeah. You know, you watch that TV show Deadliest Catch with the, the crab fisherman. Um, uh, I you know as far as toughness you don't see you don't see Navy SEALs volunteering for that crazy shit but they you know they, they do some tough guy stuff so uh, there's a yeah, survival situations 
there's a lot of a, a lot of tough guys, savvy, smart, ex-con, biker types that I would think, oh yeah, I want that guy on my team, you know, that kind of thing. I, I, there's some guys like that I want on my team. And so it really depends, you know, it really depends on how it rolls. It's going to be more difficult for a military for, for a non-military person to impress me, but I've met enough military people that were just, I, I mean, shit hit the fan. I'll be honest with you, the place I used to live, my roommates, uh, one, one of them was a Marine, uh, I'd be like, and he outranked me in the Marine Corps, but uh, when it comes to actually doing shit that's physical, I'd be like, okay, I'm in charge now, you know, and uh, you're going to do what I say, or, or the highway, dude, you know, that's the way it's going to roll. Um, and so it's it's not necessarily the same thing, but it it, it depends. And and by and large, yeah, the military person is going to be a little smarter. But the other thing is, I I think a lot of guys are interchanging some little terms here. You know, are we talking about survival, or are we talking about like some kind of underground guerrilla military? You know, under underground guerrilla unit. We don't know. And I I think there's a little bit of that too because. I mean, you can go camping and and look for firewood. I mean, there's, there's people that grow up in the woods, and people into the Boy Scouts. I mean, I mean, you can do that. I mean, I, I don't I don't get why it's that big of a deal one way or the other. Uh, a lot of the Mormon families that are that have been in the the freeze dried food industry for decades have been in the survival stuff. They know far far more about that than anybody. You know, the military hires people like that as subject matter experts, not the other way around. They, they, there's nothing the military is going to tell those people they didn't already know or probably write the book on. And um, that was one of the things somebody explained to me years ago about, like, the CIA. The CIA was known for sourcing civilian talent for various things and then using them in military applications. That's why they would call a lot of their stuff paramilitary organizations. Within a CIA, paramilitary operations or something like that, a lot of times only half of the people had ever been in the military, but they were doing something that was quasi-military or kind of that, and they, they would specialize in, in uh, using non-military personnel in, in what might otherwise be a military operation. But there was a difference between just trying to set up survival farm type stuff versus, you know, we're, we're using this as some possible code word for you know you know zombie hunting or 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 shit hit the fan stuff. Well, I don't know. Uh, what I could say is that if you got somebody who's up on their game and you got other people that recognize, hey, this guy's really up on his game. He's got a plan. Let's go along with it. And you know what it means to go along with somebody who's got a plan. Let's say they. They came up in a sports team world or business world or something like that. I mean, that's where we got it with um, the new versus the old version of Red Dawn. Okay, and the old version of Red Dawn. Well, there's the big brother who's uh, the you know had been the football quarterback or captain of the football team, and then there's uh, uh, you know the others kind of figured out. Yeah, he probably knows what's the score. He's got a, he's got a good good head for uh, instinct and what's going on with something so the you know the football team captain and we look in sports teams like that uh, traditionally that's a quarterback other times you got a star quarterback and a captain may just be a linebacker or a lineman he's just out there in a the field to get a look and say where okay we're gonna have this guy go here that guy goes there hey quarterback you're gonna do this you're gonna do that and a quarterback doesn't have to worry about the strategy all he has to do is is get around that line and throw that ball to the other guy, and he got all the jobs figured out. But you know, maybe maybe one of the linebackers is is actually the guy who's going to call shots on what's going on. Uh, you you just get a you get a feel for the human dynamic in these types of things. I I do in the job world, uh, and for a while when I worked with union carpenters, I you know a lot of guys had never been in the military, had their shit together, kind of knew how things work how things get done on larger projects which don't, you know, big projects, big corporate projects don't run like little projects. And um, you, you have this interaction between the shop steward and the, and the management and the management wants things done, the shop steward wants uh, 
you know, wants his buddies in on the good jobs, the management wants the com most competent people in on the good jobs, and so, you know, it'll be a little little work it out how it's gonna how it's gonna roll. Uh, there's been discussion in other other people's stuff about how things would work with somebody, you know, people who have or would be associated with outlaw organizations or something like that. We also have to look at what's leading into that shit hit the fan situation. Uh, but I'm I'm looking at skills, ability, what somebody's bringing to the table, how how, how can they get along? Are, are you going to have uh, a an erratic um, uh, what do they call a bipolar individual? Uh, what happens when the bipolar person starts running out of their pills or something like that? And so if we're going to make a quick decision, the, but but the big thing for me is okay who can I work with and work what who's willing to work with me uh, and what do they bring to the table and you know personally like in the job world what I prefer to do is hire people who are better than myself okay I really prefer to have I, I prefer to hire people who are better myself uh, and then uh, pay them well and I'll tell clients that, you know, yeah, I'd say I, I pay my help, I, I try to find people who are better than myself and I pay them well. And it it seems to work reasonably well like that. There's a lot of people in the military especially who are going to get real self-conscious about that. they got to be the alpha dog. Uh, now, the other thing is I'm going to try to find somebody that's a little underappreciated somewhere, somebody who's available and and they know that that good pay and that situation of of you get to be the top dog in your field is uh, you know that's predicated on working with me. Okay, you, you don't you don't go around me, you don't hop over me, none of that kind of shit. The uh, now in the military, people do that all the time. So yeah, I'll look for somebody. I. Uh, you know, they, they, I'm, I, will I compete with them a little bit? Yeah, if I'm significantly better than somebody at a particular job, then we're going to have a talk. And I'm going to say, okay, if I'm better at this than you are, why would I even hire you for this? Why, why am I bringing you for this? Because I'm better at it than you are. Why is it worth my time to have you do this if you're not even as good at, you know, if, not even, if you're not better than I am at this stuff, why are you even here? Uh, so I I look at that on stuff because I don't want to have to be responsible for everything. Okay, I I just want to be able to call the shots I need to call. And uh, and so in a survival situation, yeah, I'm looking for experts. I'm looking for somebody who's going to be good at something, somebody who's teachable. You know, we try to put somebody you know kind of master apprentice situation or a mentorship situation. And it all predicates on figuring out what somebody's bringing to the table, whether or not you can work with them, and uh, and that sort of a thing. But uh, there's just as much whiny bullshit in the military, dysfunctional egomaniacs, uh, bipolar people who not only, are, you know, they're, they're going to use their, their leverage in their position to inflict all their bipolar personality issues and, and fussy fuss crap bullshit on you. Uh, and they've gotten they gotten accustomed to it for a long time. Where in a civilian world, you'd be like, okay, this guy's a weirdo. I'm gonna quit. You know, uh, in the military, it's like, you know, you don't quit. What do you mean quit? You know, you go to the brig. You want to fucking quit? You know, you go to the fucking brig. Uh, survival situations, we don't know. I mean, I've I've tried to help people where they were in a survival situation. They they we're not going to survive their situation unless they did what I told them and worked with me on some stuff. And they still wouldn't. I mean, they wouldn't work with me on some stuff. Uh, there was a time years ago, I, I'll tell that story in another one, but there were people just, uh, you know, trying to, trying, to, trying to save their situation. They won't fucking listen to sense. And most of the time, a military person is kind of going to recognize, okay, I'm fucked and I need help. There's a lot of civilians, uh, whatever their psychological makeup was, was whatever's going on with that, they're not going to be there with that. So, I get to say that there's so many other factors to consider in these things. Um, it's only a part of it. I get you too. 
and sometimes those baggage people are a real fucking detriment to the situation other times they're another asset to the situation depending on what's going on um, a lot of times they can be a big asset to the situation uh, we I, my last National Guard unit we had a sergeant the guy was fucking worthless I mean he'd run half a PT test say he stubbed his toe and he was good he, he knew that he could get a good score once a year and the rest of the time this guy didn't perform for nothing yeah I mean he was a non-performer and the only reason they really let him stay in and keep his rank was because his wife ran the uh, family support group for the unit and she actually she administratively really had her shit together um, she she ran that family support group very very efficiently very well uh, she was knocking on doors and hustling discounts for us where you could show your military ID get discounts at different businesses she published a newsletter um, I mean she was the reason and and everybody figured out that um, with the Millers you 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 know it was like a package deal and and his wife was never you know, she was she was fat and uh, I, she made up for it in her administrative ability I mean you know not not every good woman's going to be able to make a living as a stripper on the side or something like that but uh, she she made them worth having around okay uh, as far as Sergeant Miller it's kind of like eh, you know I mean he's okay great we got somebody to fill a uniform um, I, uh, I look at that in the survival situations you got a lot of power couple types that are you know you look at the package deal it's like hey wait you know this is pretty good and then you find out they're bringing the, you know, the, the in-laws along or a parent who's in, infirm or, or another a small child you know somebody's got to take care of a toddler that changes everything there's a guy who watches my channel you know, Sly Tiger you know and then he did a video with his kid they realized oh this kid's got like a four, five year old kid four year old kid or something cute kid and I'm like hey, you know I, I, I actually probably wouldn't put that guy on the front line because I'd be like, hey man, he's got to watch a kid, you know, he's got to deal with that. Um, uh, that's a, one of the things I notice, you know. There was another guy, one of the part of the Tennessee crowd, always uses his kid and his profile stuff and all that. And uh, I'm like, yeah, okay, jerk. But that guy had presented himself as a badass and a bunch of stuff, and then, you know, kind of like wants to hide behind it his kids picture profile and stuff and I'm like yeah well you know don't don't be talking to shit you're talking if you're gonna be doing that and uh, it depends you know it depends I, I I think that because we live in a renaissance of, of tactical knowledge and training and you got you got training you got video games right now that are like combat simulators for ground level combat which we always used to think you know someday they'll have that and it would really mean a lot yeah, uh, uh, you'll look at uh, pilots just do a lot of flight simulator time yeah it makes them better pilots uh, I, I think if a lot of people are doing ground combat simulator time they're doing airsoft, they're doing milsim uh, they're doing, doing the games and the, you know they might really be on their game for that well, we look at survival skills, um, uh, engineer 775, I'm not sure if he's been in the military, it didn't seem to talk about it much, but obviously that, that's a high value individual in a situation. Uh, it's a high value individual in building a survival retreat. It, it, it's a lot about the skills, resources, personality, a lot of that stuff you bring into the table, it all counts. Military counts. Now, I'll talk about some typical type stuff, okay? Um, a military military training in a lot of respects is not really going to get you where you need to be with this survivalist stuff. It's really not. Um, there's a reason you see military veterans on the street corners fucking begging. Okay. There's a reason you'll see those guys at the VA bucking for disability payments. There's a reason you'll see them in line at the Salvation Army. Um, you you know there's reasons for that and a lot of it has to do with the fact that you know they're not criminals that they're not going to think so far outside the box that they start doing a lot of things illegally 
but they also can't deal very well outside of a structured environment. There's a lot of military people that have that, uh, uh, what do we call that, uh, uh, you know, some syndrome where they, they, they can't function out of a highly structured environment. Uh, you guys notice I'm overweight. You know, if I'm doing PT with a bunch of other people, in fact, I've, I've been losing a bunch of weight because the guys I work with just, you know, bang through 12 hours straight with maybe a lunch break. And, uh, and I, you know, you're going to lose weight and get more flexible and, and, and a little bit stronger in that situation. Uh, yeah, when I was in boot camp, I didn't drop runs. You know, I, did, I didn't do any of that stuff. What I was told, I've never been through the Green Beret training, but what I was told was that in a lot of the Green Beret schools, they don't do structured PT. And it's actually part of the test to see whether or not you would have your shit together go and do PT on your own. And if you don't do well on a test, you still fail the school. Uh, marine recon, you know, you're doing everything with somebody else. It's still a structured environment. Uh, in a civilian survival environment, you've got to be able to function in a non-structured environment. Uh, now, how you're going to do that, that kind of varies according to a lot of team dynamics. So we would look at somebody who's probably been able to survive both worlds, um, the military world and the civilian world. That's why on the, uh, the Iraq contractor stuff, a lot of the top guys were people who had been both in civilian law enforcement or higher end security, and they had been in the military at some point. One of the top guys I knew in that stuff had been uh, military, then border patrol, then executive protection. He, he's now an instructor at a lot of courses. And uh, he was one of the guys who didn't spend much time in Iraq. It was, it was part of it. I, I didn't respect him for bailing as early as he bailed, especially since he was a guy who kind of had me put, put off the team before we deployed. And then this guy lasts like two months. I, actually, I don't think he even lasted that long. Um, and it was a bit of a cop mentality in that uh, these guys don't believe in two-way gunfights, okay? They do they do ambushes or they do pylons and, th and that kind of a thing. They don't, you know, two-way defensive where somebody else take is just as likely to take the initiative. That's something these guys, a lot of times, they just don't, they don't handle. They don't deal with that. Um, they want to, they, you know, if they're not the boss of their situation, they're like, wait a minute here. You know, I got to have the right to be the boss in the situation, and, and and a lot of times they're not necessarily going to understand that. Military guy understands that. They understand we got our team, they got their team. They're going to do their things. We're going to do our things as best we can, and we might take losses because this is how it rolls. Uh, that's that goes to that whole character criticism people did on James Yeager and his first and only gunfight in Iraq. He, you know, he hit the ditch, he apparently supposedly didn't fire back, I don't know. Um, uh, there is a legitimate thing of tactical repositioning. There is a legitimate thing. The other thing is there's a legitimate um, uh, prerogative in the civilian PSD stuff. You're not there as a combat unit. Uh, you, uh, you're not there as a combat unit. you got some of the same toys, but, you know, it works differently in that. And in the uh, survivalist type environment, it's it's not a combat unit, okay. And one of the things I've dealt with with people who had never been in the military, who are like, yeah, it's a shit hit the fan. Uh, we're gonna grab our stuff, and now we're a combat unit. Well, that's where we're playing semantics on stuff. Uh, I, I've used the term semantic masturbation because. They, these guys are going to rename themselves this, this, or that to make themselves feel like they're more bigger, badder, more potent, all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, the other thing, of course, is they, uh, the other syndrome I call uh, uh, hold, beholding the talisman of virtue. Uh, you know, they figure, well, they, they, they wrap themselves in the flag or they have the talisman of virtue, therefore they know what to write, all that stuff. The talisman of virtue isn't necessarily having the, uh, you know, the right hats on your, your, your mantle. You know, I got the Marine Corps hat, I got the Army hat, I got, I got all these hats. Uh, you know, that I picked up somewhere, right, in some gun club. I, no, these didn't come from a surplus store. Uh, but the thing is, there's still a lot of people out there who have no respect for me at all. None. 
you know, there was some guy in one of uh, Haas USMC videos commenting and he wanted to pour gasoline and light me on fire because he figured I couldn't pass a background check or something like that. Uh, or, or his vector. I, I don't know. I can tell you that the BATF is not in my chain of command, ever. And uh, uh, I don't always play by the rules. You know, I usually play the rules. But uh, when I've met military people who, uh, you know, can't, you know, they're too, too much in the box and they don't get shit done, they're still employed. They have a fucking excuse and they're still employed. I, I, yeah, those, those guys won't last a week outside the military. They rarely do. Okay, uh, they they figure that out. They usually figure that out around this, you know the eight to ten year mark, and it's like, you know what, dude, you're gonna have to stay in, enjoy it, make your career up, get to your retirement age. You're gonna need that income supplement when you get out because, you know, there's, there's certain things going on in this guy's head which are gonna make it where he's probably, you know, he's not gonna work self-employed. He's not gonna be able to do that. One of the things I saw in a uh, magazine about self-employed people is that most self-employed people these days had been in the military. My my personal theory on that was that small self-employed business owners who had been in the military were people who uh, figured out that they weren't going to work too well in a structured environment. They'd rather write their own structure, but they were not stupid people. Okay, they're not weak people. And that's one of the big differences. See, there's other people that are stupid and weak, and they just okay, this didn't work, that might work, just that that, that sort of thing. Maybe they they they're not analyzing anything. You know, the cousin cousin Buck or whatever told them, hey, do this for a living. And uh, we just don't know. But if we talk about in a profile, I'll, I'll discuss that in a minute. 